35E. Correct me if I'm wrong. Take a look. Remember his great conclusion and the conclusion, of course, is that um, this argument declares that we have no bodily desires. We have no bodily desires. Oh, yeah? How so? Because it always shows that the endeavor of every living being is always towards the opposite of the actual conditions of the body. Right, remember where we were? If this person experiences thirst, that's the experience. Does the body, does the body say drink, fill? Does the body say it? Or does the mind say it? Forget about association. Right. Does the body, does the body scream, I want a drink? Or is that an activity of the mind? Therefore, he says, you occur. The mind just knows that it's empty. Your past experience might be, if you fill it with liquids, that will relieve your emptiness. But that's something you learn from experience. If you didn't learn that from the body. So therefore, would you agree on the top then? Because it shows that the endeavor of every living being is always towards the opposite of the actual conditions of the body. And the impulse which leads towards the opposite of these conditions shows that there is a memory of the opposite conditions. So this person must have a memory of what you do when you're thirsty. Is it not possible that there could be some people whose memory has been medically or through damage? been so malfunctioned, therefore, that they cannot rely upon their memory of what to do? You're saying, therefore, memory is the part of the mind. Therefore, the mind, based upon what's recorded in the memory, then suggests or screams aloud, hey, go have a drink. And the argument by showing that memory is that which leads towards the objects of desire has proved that all impulse, desire, and the ruling principle in every living being, soul, right? Right? So when you're thirsty, your memory, awakens, and you say, hey, get a drink, and therefore, go get a drink. So the argument denies utterly that the body hungers or thirsts or has any such affection. Right, that's where we landed last time. Agree?
Now, the departure point where we're going now is a real good one, right? It's contained in just one paragraph. Here it is. Let us consider a further point in connection with those very affections. For I think the purpose of the argument is to point out to us a state of life existing in them. What are we talking about? What are we talking about, he's saying? We have to go from what we've developed and we have to inquire what state of life existing in them. The purpose of the argument is to point out to us a state of life existing in them. Hmm. And thank goodness Petrarca says, huh? What the heck are you talking about? <laughs> Of what sort of life are you speaking? And in what affections does it exist? Now, if you're a good reader, this should be totally confusing. Because he has to make it clearer. Okay, so just to pull it together, the, uh, he now explains it in the following paragraph. Does he not? Come on. What he means by affections is, right? This is the puzzle. In the affections of fullness and emptiness, and all which pertain to the preservation and destruction pertain to the preservation and destruction of living beings. And I'm thinking that if we fall into one of these, we feel pain, which is followed by joy when we change to the other state. If we fall into emptiness, Fullness, right. changes. That's true. And what if someone or a man is in between these two states? Uh, what are you talking about? How between? Because of his condition, he's suffering, but he remembers the pleasures. 
Right. So he's in between. That means he experiences this and he hopes for this to be fulfilled. He's suffering, but he remembers the pleasures, the coming of which will bring him the end of his pain. Right? He remembers. So here this is an activity of remembering. He's feeling the pain, and he remembers the former state when he was enjoyment. So he's in between. This is memory. This is his condition. And yet, however, he does not possess them. Yeah. Well then, shall we say that he's between the affection or not? The affections or not? Notice what he calls affections. Hey, the state of, right, emptiness, fullness. This preserves us. This brings about a destruction. This is what he's calling affections, affections of the soul. What's a better word for affections? Experiences. But I'll stay with affections. Uh, shall we say that he is wholly pained or wholly pleased? No. But he's, aff he's afflicted with a twofold pain. He suffers in body from his sensation and soul from expectation and longing. That's his view, right? That's going to be rejected in a very short few steps. How could he, Pratarka, speak to Abhaga? How could you, Pratarka, speak of a twofold pain? Is not an empty man sometimes possessed of a sure hope of being filled and sometimes, on the contrary, feeling quite hopeless? Right. This man, hey, he's in pain, he remembers the joy, he can now hope, can he not? Or he may say, hey, I give up, I'm, it's hopeless. Who are we talking about? This man in between these two. Agree? Experiences the pain, he remembers the joy of not having the pain, right? Right. So then he can hope or be hopeless. And do you think that when he has a hope of being filled, he takes pleasure in his memory? And yet, at the same time, since he is at the moment empty, he suffers pain. Therefore, simultaneously, he can experience both and they're different. Agree? One is a function of the mind and the other of the body. Experiences the pain of being empty, thirsty, right? He can remember joy. He hopes that he may then be satisfied and he's happy. So this brings about happy. And if he's hopeless, it brings about And when an empty man is without hope but being filled, what then? Is not that the time when the twofold feeling of pain would arise, which you just now observed and thought the pain simply was twofold. Very true, Socrates. Let us make use of our examination of those affections for a particular purpose. So, oh, Eddie, what purpose do you have in mind? Okay, here's where we're going to use these two words now that are going to come in, right? Ah, didn't I put them down? Yeah, you took it off. 
True and false? Yeah. If you erase it to put this I in. I erased it. Yeah. Okay, okay. We're going to add two new words. True and false. Right to our discussion. That's where he's going. Then he's going to go for existing, and then he's going to go to real. Let us use, right? Let us make use of our examination of those affections for a particular purpose. Well, what purpose? Shall we say that those pleasures and pains are true or false? Or that some are true and others not so? But Socrates, how the heck can there ever be false pleasures or pains? That's really foolish. Right, pleasure is pleasure. How can that be a false pleasure? Very foolish, Socrates, says Protarchus. And that's now what we're going to deal with. Right? Look here, we can do it this way. Is it possible that there are all four? Petarchus is saying, hey, for pleasure, it's only true. Pain, perhaps there can be a true and false pain, but there's no such thing as a false pleasure. So Socrates has to say, I got news for you. There is room for a false pleasure. That's where the discussion goes. So you've got the table? But, um, Protarchus actually says pleasures or pains. Yeah, shall we say that those pleasures and pains are true or false? Or that some are true and others not so? Now we're going to take a look. But Socrates, how can there be false pleasures or pains? I mean, a pain is pain. So he's saying, hey, look here, they're just Protarchus. You can't have, have any false pleasures or false pains. Pains are just real. I mean, that's all. You can't have a false pain. That's very foolish. So Socrates is going to have to deal with us. Let's see how he deals with it. He's got to make room for this one and this one, right? Room in each one. Protarchus says, no, no, no. Okay, now he's going to do two things now. He's going to add more fun in this by adding another word. All right. Opinions. Ah. Are there going to be true and false opinions? Then he's going to, hey, then he's going to combine these in different ways. But this is the, basically the table, isn't it? But Petrarchus, how can there be true and false fears and true and false expectations? Opinions, I'll grant that, but not the rest. All right, I'll only say they're false opinions, but not for the rest of them. So he has nothing except one check under opinions, doesn't he? 
So Socrates has to show how you can fill in these boxes. But why is he doing all of this? Because of that original question we put on the board. Um, let's do it. Um, and yet we must consider, thou son of that man, whether the discussion is relevant to what has gone before. Yeah. We must, we, we must dismiss everything else, tedious or otherwise, that is irrelevant. Right. Now tell me. For I'm always amazed by the same questions we were just proposing. Look here. <clears throat> I'm going to sneak in another category, but don't write it down. I mean, can you have a false amazement, a true amazement? Socrates says, yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm really, this is real. The same questions, hey, you know what, they amaze me. What, 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 how can this stuff amaze anybody? Huh? Foolish. Right. What do you mean? Are not some pleasures false and the other true? How can that be, Socrates? Of course not. Right, they're going to only be true pleasures. You can't have a false pleasure. Pleasures are pleasures, and they're all pleasurable, and therefore they're all true. It can't be both true and false. Then, as you maintain, now here comes where he takes off. <clears throat> then, as you maintain, nobody, either sleeping, waking, insane, deranged, ever thinks he feels pleasure when he doesn't feel it, and never, on the other hand, thinks he suffers pain when he does not suffer it. When he feels pleasure, of course he feels pleasure. No one, in whatever, whatever condition they're, they're in, ever thinks he feels pleasure and doesn't feel it. Or thinks he suffers pain when he doesn't suffer it. Oh, I've always believed that. But is that right? Is that right or is that foolish? Right? Is that right? Look here, you've got to put that in your own words. What's the issue? Come on, put it in your own words. Take a minute out, okay? Is it out of sight, out of mind? Sir? Is it out of sight and out of mind? Out of sight, out of mind. That's basically what you're saying. If, you're, if you don't think of it, do you have it? It's out of mind. No one ever thinks he feels pleasure when he doesn't feel it. I mean, if he feels it, he feels it. No one ever suffers pain when he doesn't suffer it. But is that correct? Of course, it, he's wrong again, which is why I read him, he's always wrong, right, Socrates? Well, we'll have to consider whether it's so or not. Yeah, he said, I'm sure we ought to consider it. Okay, now to deal with this issue, he now moves over here to opinion. Mm -hmm. This is where opinion now plays a role. So now the discussion is going to move to opinion and how it relates to pleasure and pain. 
and the experience of it. That's where we're going, okay? Here we go. <clears throat> then let us analyze still more clearly what we were just now saying about pleasure and opinion. Uh, by the way, there's a faculty of having an opinion, is there not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, right, there's a faculty of it. Right, right, right. There's something in us that expresses it, right? Right. And uh, there's a fact of opinion, is there not? Yeah, yeah. And a feeling pleasure? Yep. Is there an object of opinion? Sure, 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 sure. Must have an object, you don't have an opinion. And something by which uh, that which feels pleasure is pleased? Right, there must be something on us that uh, feels pleasure when we're pleased. Is that right? Yeah, 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 of course. There must be something in me that feels pleasure when I'm pleased. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that which has opinion, whether right or wrong, never loses its function of really having an opinion. I mean, really. If you really have an opinion whether you're right or wrong. Right. Opinions exist whether they're right or wrong. And that which feels pleasure, whether right or wrong, will clearly never lose its function of really feeling pleasure. Ah, oh, same logic, look, same logic he's putting over here. Same logic. Ah, huh. must be something, therefore, that feels the pleasure or the pain. Yeah, yeah, must have an object, right? Uh, whether it's right or wrong. Now, our friend Petarchus has to be upset. <laughs> then that which feels pleasure, whether right or wrong, will clearly never lose its function of really feeling the pleasure. Yes, that's true. Then we must consider how it is that the opinion is both true and false and pleasure only true. Though the holding of opinion and the feeling of pleasure, watch the word, are equally real. Remember the word? Now we get it. Real. That is, you really experience what it is you experience. It's real. In that sense, it exists for you. You mean that we must consider this question because falsehood and truth are added as attributes of opinion and thereby becomes not merely opinion but opinion of certain quality in each instance? Well, right or wrong, now he sneaked by and said, well, you know what? Uh, opinions can either be false or true. <clears throat> Look, he's working out the structure of what it is to have an opinion. He's saying they both have a similar dynamic. So whatever he works on the one, I'm going to put it over here. We have to see if that's legit. So Petarchus is on it now. He sees this. Then we must consider how it is that opinion is both true and false and pleasure is only true. 
though the holding of opinion and the feeling of pleasure are equally real. See, they're similar, but both equally real. They equally exist. Yeah, so we must. You mean that we must consider this question because falsehood and truth are added? They're added as attributes of it? Things you can say about it, they're attributes of it? True opinion? And thereby it becomes not merely opinion, but opinions that have a certain quality in each instance of either being true or false. Right, have an opinion, but true or false, yeah. You're adding something to it, right? That's a quality. Hey, by the way, we must uh, reach an agreement on the question whether even if some things have qualities, pleasure and pain, pain are merely what they are without qualities? Because if pleasure and pain have these qualities, what follows? False pleasures. Then the sum are true and false. So Petrarchus has to say, oh, no, 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 no. It can't have such qualities. What qualities? Of being true and false. Because if he says that, then they have the qualities of being both true and false, true and false, true and true. But it's uh, easy enough to see that they have qualities. But we said a long time ago that both pains and pleasures uh, are great, small, and intense. Oh, yeah, yeah, we did say pleasures and pains are greater or lesser or intense, yeah, yeah. Hey, if badness becomes an attribute of any of these, shall we not say the opinion or the pleasure thereby becomes bad? Look, these are attributes. He says, let's add another attribute. If we can add the word bad... If you can add the idea of bad as an attribute to opinions, can you also add bad to uh, pleasures? Yep. So he's got them parallel, doesn't he? And if badness becomes an attribute of any of those, Petrarca, shall we say that the opinion and the pleasure both therefore become bad? Bad or false? Why, certainly, Socrates. And what if rightness and its opposite becomes an attribute of one of them? Shall we not say that the opinion is right? If it has rightness and the pleasure likewise? Uh-oh. Yeah. And if that which is opined or has opinions is mistaken, must we not agree that the, the opinion since it is at the moment making a mistake, is not rightly uh, or wrongly opining? Must we not say it's either rightly or wrongly opining? Yeah, sure. Here he goes now. New word coming in. And what if we see a pain or a pleasure making a mistake in respect to that by which the pleasure or pain is caused? New idea. He's now introducing the idea of cause. Hmm. Sneak that in, so now he's going to use it. Let's see how he uses it, all right? And what if rightness and its opposite, wrongness, becomes an attribute of one of them? Shall we not say that the opinion is right, if it has rightness, and uh, pleasures likewise? Yeah. And if that which is opined is mistaken, must we not agree that the opinion, since it is at the moment making a mistake, is uh, not right or rightly opining? Of course. Here we are now. And what if we see a pain or a pleasure making a mistake in respect to that of which the pain or pleasure is caused? Shall we give it the attribute of right or good or any of the words which denote excellence? got to stay on that paragraph. See, that's a major one. 
introducing another word, excellence, cause, got it? And what if we see pain or pleasure making a mistake in respect to that which the pleasure of pain has caused? Hmm. Shall we give it the attribute of right or uh, good? Or any of the words which denotes excellence? If someone has a medical condition, right, it's causing them pain. Is it not likely that someone might make a mistake in respect to discovering its cause? You might assign it to one cause, your doctor might assign it another cause, might they not? Huh? Mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm. that possible? Oh, huh. Shall we give it the attribute of right or wrong? Or any of the words which uh, denote excellence? We could say it's a good diagnosis, a bad diagnosis, couldn't we? In terms of what causes the pain? That's impossible if pleasure is mistaken. And certainly pleasure often comes, seems to come to us in connection with false, not true opinion. Of course it does. And in such a case, Socrates, we call the opinion false, but nobody would ever call the actual pleasure false. No, Socrates, we can't do that. We can't call the pleasure false. No. I don't care about your argument. So what's he going to do? I said, you know what, you're, <laughs> you're a pretty good advocate <laughs> of the case of pleasure. You're really holding up a good defense. This is why I only say what I hear. <laughs> this is what I've heard, that's what I'm giving it. <laughs> So, now watch, watch now, okay. A new object to explore. He now has to find another way of bringing this guy to see it. Say, is there no difference, my friend, between the pleasure which is connected with right opinion and knowledge, and that which often comes to each of us with falsehood and ignorance? See what he's doing? He's now moving and combining the two, see? See, what if pleasure is connected with opinion? So now he's going this way, isn't he? What if pleasure, right, is connected with opinion, and now right and wrong? What happens if you're talking about these two together? See, now he's going to mix them up. Is there no difference, my friend, between the pleasure which is connected with right opinion, knowledge, and that which comes to each of us with falsehood and ignorance? Shouldn't there be a difference between a pleasure that's connected with Right, right opinions and knowledge. And what, another one which comes with falsehood and ignorance? Hmm. Doesn't deny the pleasure. Say, is it possible that some people can uh, visit the temple of the rat and get a great deal of pleasure out of it even though it's false? Have you ever been to the Temple of the Rock? No. What? No? <laughs> You're weird. <laughs> yes? Have you ever been to the Temple of the Rock? You mean Disneyland? Yeah. <laughs> Don't they go there to celebrate a rat? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole joint is what? The Temple of the Rock, isn't it? The rodents. Is that right? 
And what, hey, did they go in there? Is, do they enjoy it? Is it a pleasure? Connected with an opinion, which is true or false. They even put hats on them with ears, right? <laughs> I went over there with a bag full of rats to ears. I cut off, you know, and they threw me out. <laughs> a bunch of slobs. Right? Imagine that. I told them it's cheaper. Yeah, you, I cut them off the rats. Yeah, all right, okay, all right. Hey, there's a great difference there, Socrates, between when pleasure is connected with opinion and opinions are either, hey, see what he's doing? Right or wrong, true or false. See, he's combining them. See how he's doing them? Yeah, there's a great difference. Then let's proceed to the contemplation of the difference between them. Ah, the difference between pleasure when connected with opinion, when it follows knowledge and what's true, and when it's, uh, pleasure is connected with opinion and it follows something that's false or based upon ignorance. Let's compare them. Let's see what we got here. Are there other temples other than the rat in Southern California? Any of them that are true? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let us then proceed to the contemplation of the difference between them. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Lead us on as you think best. Then, this is the way I'm going to lead. What way? Do you agree that there's such a thing as a false opinion and also a true opinion? Okay, so we got, right, true and false opinions, right? He's asking about this box and this. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, as we were saying just now, pleasure and pain often follow them. I mean, true and false opinion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 certainly, yeah, yeah. Do we then believe that our relation to these faculties is somewhat as follows? Okay, now, um, he's going to have some fun now with an image. Okay? And it's the book and the painter, right? Okay, the book and the painter. Uh, we don't need that, so we can take that up. Now, notice what he's going to do. He's going to build a very interesting model. Do not opinion and the power of forming an opinion always come to us from memory and perception? Right, right, right. Hey, what's opinion? Do not opinion and the power of forming an opinion always come to us from memory and perception. Not put into words, hey, not put into words, just that much. No logos yet, uh, no shared logos. Certainly. Do we then believe that our relation to these faculties is somewhat as follows? Uh, how? Would you, would you say that when a man sees things at a distance and not very clearly, he wishes to distinguish between the things which he sees. Yeah, 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 I think so. Next then, would he not ask himself, what? What is that which is visible standing beside the rock under a tree? Do you think a man, think a man might ask himself such a question if he saw such objects presented to his view? Well, is there something visible over there standing behind a rock, right? Standing beside a rock under a tree. See it way out there? Uh, our gazer might reply, ah, 
Zemaim. Or again, perhaps you might be misled into the belief that it was the work of some shepherds and then he would be calling the thing which he saw an image, would he not? Or a scarecrow, right? You might say, oh, it's a scarecrow, <laughs> right? You might be wrong. He might be misled into the belief that it was the work of some shepherds, misled. It was really a man, but he might, may have been misled into thinking maybe it was a scarecrow. Could have, at a distance. If so, then he only saw an image of the man, not, a, not the man. Agree? Is that right or wrong? Mm -hmm. Oh. Hey, if someone is with him, he might repeat aloud to his companion what he has uh, said to himself. And thus that which we called an opinion now becomes a statement. Shared logos. Now, no longer opinion. Opinion is something private. Now it becomes a statement. Certainly. But if he is alone when he has this thought, he some carries it about in his mind for a long time. Yeah, he might. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, is your view about what takes place in such cases the same as mine? Oh, what's yours? I think the soul at such a time it's like a book. Is that how is the soul like a book? Well, memory unites with the senses, and they and the feelings which are connected with them seem to me almost to write words in our soul. Memory unites with the senses, writes, seems to be almost to, to write words in our souls. And when the feelings in question writes the truth, Hey, then you have true opinions, and true statements are produced in us. Right. But when the writer within us writes the falsehoods, the resulting opinion and statements are false. Yeah, as I accept that. And then accept also the presence of another workman in our souls, at the same time. Oh. A painter. A painter who paints in our soul's pictures to illustrate the words which the writer has written, right? So, he takes what's written, uses that to draw images. Painter has engraver. Right, pretty good. And they become the images of those opinions and utterances, don't they? And the images of the true opinions are true, and those are false, false. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, okay. Now he's going to push the implications of the model. That's where he's going. Uh, then, if we're right about that, let's consider a further question. Huh? What's that? Whether this is an inevitable experience in relation to the present and past, but not in relationship to the future. Huh? Okay, now we have time comes in. So far, we don't know why he's introducing time. Well, that's what he's got, right? Whether this is inevitable, an inevitable experience in relation to the present and the past, but not in relation to the future. Right? And watch this because he's going to switch on this. So watch the way he develops. He's going to switch on this. Okay? So at this point, he's saying, I think we got this, but not this. But he's going to hold that for a short while. So Petrarca says, hey, wait a minute, I think it's in the same relation all kinds of time. I, I, I don't think it's uh, missing in the future. Was it not said a while ago that the pleasure and pains which belong to the soul alone might come before the pleasures and pains of the body? So that we have pleasure and pain of anticipation which relate to the future? Is that what we said? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what we said. Yeah, that, yeah, I remember that earlier in the book. Yeah. Now he goes back to the image. All right, goes back to these two images. Do the writings and the pictures, then, which we mad imagined a little while ago to exist within us, relate to the past, present, but not to the future? No, no, to the future especially, Socrates. Do you, do you say to the future especially because they are all hopes relating to the future, right? And we're always filled with hopes all our lives? Ah. Right. Wow. Hopes are always connected with the future. So what? Well, let's see what he does with it. Well, I got a further question. What's that, another one? Say, a just and pious and good man is surely a friend of the gods, right? Yeah. Unjust, thoroughly bad man is the reverse? Yeah. But as we were just now saying, every man is full of many hopes? Yeah. And they're all, then, and they are all of us, right? <laughs> they are, in all of us, written words which we call hopes. Ah, these words written in our soul about the future are hopes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And also the image is painted there. And often a man sees an abundance of gold coming into his possession. And in its train many pleasures. He even sees a picture of himself enjoying himself immensely. Right? With all that gold. Ah, ha. Yes, certainly. Shall we or shall we not say that these uh, pictures are for the most part true, which are present to the good, especially if they're friends of the gods, whereas those presented to the bad are for the most part false? Huh, hey, are these pictures, are these pictures, which are pictures of the hopes, mostly true or most of them hope, most of them false? He says, ah, most of the hopes are false. Yeah, we must say that. Then the bad also, no less than the good, have pleasures painted in our souls, but they're false pleasures. Yeah, yeah. Then the bad rejoice for the most part in the false and the good in true pleasures. Yeah, that's true. 
Okay. And now we take off into a new subject, right? He's now going to shift. Watch the shift. According to our present view, then, there are false pleasures in the souls of men, imitations or caricatures of the true pleasures and pains likewise. This is new. What's the new role? New term? Imitations. Look at what he's saying. According to our present view, see, he said a lot of these future hopes are false, and they're imitations of the, of the true. We say, you remember, that he who had an opinion at all always really had an opinion, but it was sometimes not based upon realities, whether present, past, or future. Right? We're now back to reality. Here we are. What do you mean, his conclusion? I mean that he who feels pleasure at all, in any way or manner, hey, you know what, he always feels pleasure. But it's sometimes not based upon realities, whether present or past, and often perhaps most frequently upon things which will never even be realities in the future. Yeah, this also, Socrates, must inevitably be the case. Then the same may be said of fear and anger and all the other sort of things. Yeah. Well, can we say that opinions become bad or good except by becoming false? No. And we understand, I believe, that pleasures also are not bad except by being false? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Quite the reverse of that, Socrates. For no one would would be at all likely to call pleasure and pains bad because they are false, but because they are involved in another great manifold evil. Right? New subject. Right? You say, oh no, it's not a question of good or bad or anything else like this. We need a new word, says Protarchus. You've got to think in my terms. Evil. Have you ever known anyone who thought about evil, thinks of it, the, the pleasures are evil? Have you? Probably not in this group. <laughs> ever hear of any? Have you heard that thought? Yes. Oh well, then it's legit. That's good what I hear. <laughs> okay. Hey, big issue. Next paragraph. Two paragraphs together. Percharchus. No. You have said quite the reverse of the truth, Socrates. No one would be at all likely to call pains and pleasures bad because they are false, but because they were involved in another great and manifold evil. Oh, says Socrates, none of the evil pleasures, which are such because of evil, we will speak a little later, if we care to do so under the table. But of the false pleasures, we must prove in another way that they exist and come into existence in us often, in great numbers, for this may help us reach our, our, our decisions. So what does he do with the question of evil? He says, ah, let's put that under the table and forget it for a while and continue our discussion. Therefore, that whole issue is dumped. Why? Because we have our goal. But of the false pleasures, we must prove in another way that they, one, exist, come into existence often in great numbers, for this may help us reach our decisions. Yeah, if they exist. Okay, so we quit. Good place. Now look here, I want to raise this question. See, does it help in any way to, uh, even though I sketched out somewhat clumsily, did this help any? See, he's got a structure. 
It's got a structure he's following. So, and try to try to represent the structure. Then you can follow the structure and anticipate where it's going. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm drying out, so I'm going to... I'm empty. So my memory tells me if you drink something, it might help. That's not from the body. You remember drinking? Oh, right. I'm remembering. I have an opinion formed. <laughs> and I hope.